Hey, everybody. How are we doing? Welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. Today is Sunday, October 25th, 2020. And I'm your host, Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, my friend, Johnny P. Angel. How are you? Hey, I'm all right, Matt. How are you doing? Uh, I'm not bad at all. I'm uh, happy to be here. And I want to get the announcements out of the way. There's regular announcements and special announcements. And then we're going to take your calls because this is a live call-in show sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational corporation supporting positive atheism and the separation of religion and government. You can find out more about the ACA by visiting atheist-community.org. Uh, if you're watching us live, as I remind people every week, and actually I just went into the chat and I was just like, like, subscribe, donate, participate, and boom, somebody immediately donated. And that reminded me that right up above the chat is a donate link on YouTube. If you're watching live, 100% of the donations go directly to the ACA to help us produce this program in addition to other programs. And I'll be talking more about those other programs in just a moment. In addition to donating directly there, you can also order yourself some merchandise. If you prefer to have something tangible for your support, you can get coffee cups and t-shirts and all kinds of other good things there at bit.ly slash aen merch in addition you can also become a member on youtube membership options are available and you can go to patreon.com slash the atheist experience uh, to support us there as well uh, we also have two new facebook pages that we're directing people to just so that um, you know they, they can find the people who are actively participating and talking about the aca and and the atheist experience in these shows and the first one is the atheist experience fan group and the address is right there on your screen and the second one is the atheist experience private fan group that address is on your screen as well notice it doesn't say secret fan group it'd be really stupid for us to create a secret fan group and then post you know a link to it right away so you don't have access to the secret fan group uh, I, I don't think it exists, but you definitely don't have access to it. Maybe the atheist inner circle knows about the uh, secret fan group. It could be. I'm waiting for, you know, I've got my inner yeah. circle t-shirt. Uh, yeah. I'm waiting for my, my inner circle membership card so we can go in my wallet. But the yeah. uh, important thing is that I get to show up on Sundays and sit here and interact with people and have fun and have a good time because yeah. of the work of a whole bunch of other people who we're going to put up on the screen now. And that's the most amazing crew in the history of internet mm -hmm. programs ever. Uh, some of them are screening calls. Some of them are working on video. Some of them are working on audio. I think some of them actually aren't working at all. It's just that they wanted to be on screen when we announced the crew because they missed some other opportunity. Uh, I, I actually love it. Yeah. Uh, and now that I've noticed something, I'm just kind of waiting for others to as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. One thing that's happened is that, you know, we we do, in addition to this program, there is Secular Sexuality on Thursdays and Truth Wanted on Fridays and Talk Heathen airs at one o'clock on Sundays. And the nonprofits are back and the nonprofits air Sundays at 3 p.m. You may have just accidentally or intentionally seen that episode of the nonprofits, but if you would like more information and you want to watch that episode that just aired or watch other episodes, the at the bottom of the screen right now, you'll see youtube.com slash the nonprofits ACA. That's the link to go find the nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Johnny, tell us a little bit about that. The nonprofits is a show that's been on for quite a, quite a while. We've been uh, off the air working on some of our formatting and bringing in some new guests, polishing up some stuff. Um, so we just got our first show back on the air after about six months off. We've been on Discord. You're going to see some new faces. You're going to see some new guests. Uh, we've got some interesting people. Uh, who are interested in being on there, Mandisa Thomas, Shannon Q, Bila Bianca, we've got uh, Neil, the 604 Atheist, and other people who are interested in, in participating. And the show is really about you know, current events, some deep dives into some strange issues, some, some cult experiences, some uh, fake science, uh, charlatan preachers, what have you, uh, bad shepherds, and what have you, um, different kinds of things like that. But we generally cover the news, and we go back and forth between that and some more a perennial topics. Um, and uh, I hope you'll all tune in to watch it. Uh, it airs between uh, Talk Heathen and AXP. We just had one on. Uh, and uh, it's going to be every week. There should be a new show. So I'm I'm helping getting it back on the on the on the air, getting more shows out. So um, we like to get feedback. So if you see that show, if you like it, let us know. Email us at radio at atheist-community.org if there's something you like that you saw. If there's something you don't like, tell us that too. We can take it. We're pretty tough. And now on to something. I, I talked about this on Wednesday, and so I'm not going to go into it in great detail. But on, on Wednesday nights, I do a show called The Hang Up uh, on a different network. It's not an ACA show, and I'm not here to advertise it. I just don't want any confusion between what I do here with the ACA and what I do on my own. Uh, the Hang Up 
being considerably more political and uh, a personal, I don't know, uh, effort of love and fun by me. But on, on Wednesday's episode, I talked about the fact that um, a friendly acquaintance of mine who I respect greatly and who significantly impacted my life and the lives of many, uh, who most of you know as the amazing Randy, uh, died at 92. And there's a, uh, a graphic up on the screen right now, you know, including one of his uh, famous quotes of, I'm, I'm a liar, a cheat, and a charlatan, but at least I know it. Um, he, there was a grand documentary about him called An Honest Liar. This is my copy of it. And of course, I'm, I'm holding it in a way where uh, the light reflects on it. There you go. This one was actually given to me by Randy personally, which is why I haven't taken it out of plastic. I have, in fact, watched the documentary. I've watched it several times. And I've pointed out that I wish that there were three documentaries of The Amazing Randy. One of him as a magician, one of him as a skeptic, and then one of him as a human. And that video touches on all three of them but loosely, uh, 92 years of an amazing life, um, just promoting reason and skepticism, uh, being good natured about it, pointing out that while we can engage in testing of things and attempting to confirm things, that skepticism is not about debunking, even if that happens on occasion, because sometimes people come forward with a claim that is unfalsifiable, which means there's no way that you could show that it was false. And in other cases, they come forward to claiming they can do things in a way where you may be able to demonstrate that they can't, or at least demonstrate that on this day, in this way, they were unable to produce the effect that they think they have, whether it's remote viewing or faith healing or clairvoyance and psychokinesis. Um, he famously would chug an entire bottle of homeopathic sleeping pills on stage in order to point out that homeopathy is water and that any claim that it does anything is clearly bullshit, uh, as is evidenced by, you know, chugging an entire bottle of sleeping medicine at the beginning of a lecture and then giving the entire lecture um, and not needing to go to the hospital. I was fortunate enough to do a, an event with him in Vancouver. Um, where we sat down on stage. It's on YouTube. You can go watch it. We sat down on stage to talk for a little bit, and then Randy did a magic trick or two, uh, and then took a seat in the audience as myself and Sean Farquhar, the two-time world champion of magic. I'm required by law to say that every time I mention his name. Hi, Sean. Love you. Uh, but myself and, and Sean and Mary Hatfield, who's a brilliant, brilliant magician uh, from Canada, who I also adore. Uh, we did a show, and we did it for the audience, but when you have the amazing Randy sitting on stage before the show and then out in the audience during the show, like I remember being on stage and getting volunteers and doing stuff. And the only thing I cared about was looking at one seat in the audience and seeing whether or not he was smiling, whether or not he was nodding, whether or not he had a, you know, cause the approval of, of him while I'm on stage doing magic, um, it was one of the highlights of my life. I will miss him dearly. And I wasn't even a good friend with him. I mean, he's, I, I feel especially sorry for his husband uh, and for, you know, Penn and Teller who, I mean, there wouldn't be a Penn and Teller without Randy. Um, I just, he's done a lot for the world and I'm sorry and I'll miss him. And I don't mean to go on for hours, but yeah, uh, my, my world is a little dimmer, but that's okay because he made it so much brighter before he left. Uh, that I'm still much, much better off. So, actually, watched the uh, his TED talk last night, um, the one where he chugged the sleeping pills and talked about um, the the research lab that was tricked by a, a classic uh, magician's trick using a matchbook. So, yep. and great. then there's Project Alpha. Just go watch the documentary and everything else. Um, we're, we're I I am. I am happy that I know I knew him. Uh, I miss him terribly, and uh, the world is better off for his existence and worse that he's not here. So, but we have callers waiting. Sure do. And some of these calls may make uh, claims that we can perhaps debunk a little bit, but mainly mm -hmm. it's about interacting with people, finding out what they believe and why, and why they think we should believe. So, where are we going first, Shane? Um, uh, I'm looking at um. How to, how to, what criteria to determine if a claim is extraordinary? That'd be Heath in Texas. Great. Hey, Hello, Heath. How's it going? And, and uh, Johnny. 
So, uh, yeah, you read, read my question. Correct. I basically, um, I'm sort of building out my arsenal of street epistemology. And, um, so I wanted to know how you can tell whether one belief is extraordinary or not, and how you can tell sort of which, uh, is, you know, is there like a sort of scale or something like that? I wanted to hear your all's thoughts on it. That's an interesting question. You know, what, when I think of a claim is extraordinary, I, what I tend to think is, does this fit in line with what I have experienced in my years on this earth? Um, is it fit in the everyday? Um, you know, sometimes we hear about scientific claims that seem extraordinary, and then usually it's backed up by uh, research and data, and they can be explained in, in some regard. But um, as far as non-scientific extraordinary claims, like, um, I don't know, a Coke bottle flies across the room, I would say that doesn't fit in with, with uh, my everyday experience of the extraordinary. And then I want to know more, just as I would with a scientific claim. So um, that's my definition, I think. I mean, uh, and it ever expands as science progresses. Um, uh, m more things tend to become ordinary when we have an explanation for it. Matt, do you have an, a, a definition of an extraordinary claim? Um, so one of the things is, is that I did a video recently talking about how it's not so much that a claim is extraordinary in and of itself. It is the facts about the claim are either consistent with what we already know and understand about reality, or they are inconsistent with it. And so I, I don't know, I don't know how this would work in a courtroom. Um, so I'm glad Johnny's here because mm -hmm. he would know. But I tend to think of things, in, in, despite the fact that I'm not a lawyer, I tend to think of things in, in terms of a courtroom. And if you were to make a statement in a courtroom where um, the opposition could object and ask that you offer some substantiation for that claim, if that's likely to happen, then I would say that that is a claim that is at least somewhat extraordinary. If you just say, you know, it's like if, if Johnny's in court and says the sky is blue, Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to demand that you provide evidence for that or that gravity works or that, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't even know. And so largely it's, so the, 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 the famous claim is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And the thing is all claims require however much evidence is required to warrant acceptance of that. And, and the only reason we point to some claims as, as extraordinary is because Sometimes at face value and the available evidence, we already just accept something and other things require a little more. So when you say I have a pet dog, it's not that you're making a claim without evidence. It's you are making a claim that is consistent with all the evidence. We know that dogs exist. We know that people have dogs as pets. We know that people like to take, you know, talk about, hey, I just got a new pet puppy and everything else. There's everything about your claim is consistent with everything everybody already recognizes about reality. As a matter of fact, somebody, anybody who came forward and said, what do you mean you got a dog? Prove that dogs exist. I mean, we would look at them a little askew. And yeah. that yeah. departing from that is where you start to get into extraordinary claims. And what all we're really saying is that you're going to need to come with additional evidence beyond what we already know about reality for us to accept it. Yeah. So can I jump in real quick? Um, yeah, sure. So, so, um, you know, Johnny, you talked sort of about how it seems like, um, the extraordinariness of a claim for you is subjective. Does that, does that sound like a good representation of your, I would say I, would say I have my own subjective experience, but I think that my experience of life is not really all that different from yours and Matt's in the day to day, uh, life. Um, you know, I go to the grocery store, I go to sleep, I wake up, I go to the bathroom, I eat, I see people, uh, there's object permanence, there's, uh, there's trees, there's clouds. And these are all ordinary things that I see every day, nothing out of the ordinary. But when something out of the ordinary happens, I think that in order for me to or I'm sorry, if there's a claim of something that's out of the ordinary, I'm going to want to have explanations that will explain it in a way that makes sense to me. Now, in my life, I've never had an experience that I haven't been able to explain through ordinary means, right? I hear a sound in the middle of the night. Well, probably my imagination. I see a shadow on the wall. 
and I lose track of what room I'm in. Oh, it's just I'm in a, I'm a semi dream state or something like that. But if I had a Coke bottle fly across the room and hover in front of me and start talking to me, I would start perhaps I would start questioning whether this was an ordinary experience and I would start seeking explanations to sort of bring it down to earth in, in, an, in an ordinary way. I'm having a hallucination. My mind is, is drifting from its ordinary mental state. Um, but it's never happened to me. So I guess it is subjective. There are people who have had these experiences and some accept supernatural explanations. I don't know why they do. And some are quicker to go toward you know, a hallucination or some sort of a, a break in a, in, in their in their mental health. I don't know what it might be, but go on what, what, with your question. Is, yeah. is that answer? I was, yeah, I kind of, so I mean, I was talking to my friend and she claims that ghosts exist and she claims that she has all these experiences that are unexplainable except by the existence of ghosts, but she couldn't see why that belief was extraordinary because she's had so many of these mystical experiences. So I was just trying to kind of figure out how I could explain to her that that belief is extraordinary. And maybe okay. I can't. I don't know. Well, so she she's explaining that there's super. She reached a conclusion. So we don't deny that she may have had these experiences that she can't explain. Right? We're not calling her a liar. Um, we're saying that you know, okay, you saw something, you, you experienced something, right? But now you've jumped to a conclusion that there's this realm outside of the ordinary. You're claiming now exists. Yeah. Why yeah. should we believe that it exists? When, when she says this isn't explainable by anything other than ghosts, yeah. first of all, how do you know? How do you know that this is the only explanation and B, when the only explanation that you have left is something that you have no good evidence for, you know, it, it, it's fundamentally identical to saying, ah, I don't have any explanation for this other than magic, other than 20,000 other potential things that I can't prove. And so what we got is someone who's like, I really, I had an experience. I want to understand it. The only thing that someone has presented to me that makes it somewhat make sense is that there's a ghost. But that doesn't mean that there's a ghost. That just means that you haven't been presented with an explanation that is, you know, evidence based and supportive of of your actual proposition. And so it's not like your friend has evidence for ghosts. Your friend is essentially making a, a fallacious uh, argument from incredulity in, in some, some sense that she can't believe it's anything other than a ghost. And that's about her failure of imagination and just general ignorance that we all have on how to explain this experience that she had. Yeah, why, why is it a ghost? Why isn't it? Maybe uh, I, yeah, so I think I misinterpreted her position. She said that these um, events are only explainable by a force that science has yet to uh, discover. And so to me, that seems like an extraordinary claim that there's some force that science has not yet discovered. But to her, it did not seem so extraordinary. Well, it's not extraordinary that there may be something that science hasn't discovered. What's extraordinary is that mm -hmm. in the face of science having not discovered something, yeah. she thinks she's found the right answer. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, she has no evidence for it. And, and when, you, when your evidence for something is, well, I have discovered something that science hasn't discovered yet. Okay, cool. Go get your Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, did she, yeah did that, she, was, that was really useful. Yeah. Has she has she explained to you how she how she can he, she knows it's a ghost and not let's say you know to use something from you know Truth Wanted like a a tulpa speaking to her whispering her truths or aliens communicating with with her in the in the brain yeah. like how does she determine that it was That's, ghosts specifically? Yeah, like I said, she so she said that I believe ghosts exist, and then later she told me I don't even know what ghosts are. So what what mm -hmm. she was really saying was there's she was claiming that there was some force that science hadn't discovered, basically. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Well, when when she can actually demonstrate that, then that becomes part of science. the The problem is is that it's clear now that she believes something while simultaneously saying there really isn't any good reason to believe this, but I'm going to believe it anyway. And I would want to know, I mean, you know, my, my 
first question after getting that far is why on earth does she believe something while also acknowledging that she doesn't have good reason to believe now she may not say i don't have a good reason to believe this but you may have to have the conversation to talk about at what point should we become convinced of something and if that and if she thinks the point that we should become convinced is when she suspects that there's an explanation that science just hasn't discovered yet mm -hmm. i mean that and and heath can i can i ask you this i, I remember um, now Heath, Heath, let me ask you this though: uh, How uh, the 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 tone of these conversations that you're having with your friend are they friendly conversations where you're just where she's like, well, yeah, I just kind of believe it's ghosts, right? Or is she impassioned about it? Are you stepping on her feet oh. by challenging her belief in the ghosts, or is it more friendly, friendly banter? I was intentionally trying to imitate Anthony. Magnum Busco, I don't really know how you say his last name, but the the you know he's been on this show a couple times. So Anthony Magnum Busco. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so using street epistemology yeah, techniques it. to try to elicit mm -hmm. the, the the level of confidence she has and the epistemological exactly. foundation for why she believes that, and and she's been game for it the entire time, and she just enjoys the conversation. Right. Yeah, and you're not hammering yeah. her every time a, you get you see her. <laughs> no, I think I, I would have phrased that was, differently if I were you. Sorry, Johnny. Yeah, don't 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 hammer anybody uh, unless they are fully yeah. <laughs> consenting to hammering. Um, but no, you're no, just you're um, maybe yeah, can I? So the reason that this was a problem is because we had talked through you know strong evidence and and how if a claim is extraordinary, it needs strong evidence and uh, personal testimony is not really strong evidence and she didn't believe that her claim was extraordinary which is why she felt that she was justified in um claiming that it was true because it wasn't that extraordinary she also didn't have very extraordinary evidence to back it up he, he here, here's some here's a tack you might take um there t tends to be a tendency i've noticed amongst uh, skeptics, non-believers in the community who they want to get that gotcha moment. They want to turn somebody in the conversation. They want to get them to just say, you're right. Everything I believe is nonsense. I, I give it all up, right? Uh, maybe don't, don't think that you're going to win this uh, with a, a direct attack. Maybe uh, just talk with her about what constitutes good evidence. Bring to her attention other examples of extraordinary claims. Uh, in, in different parts of the world, they have uh, holy men who can claim that they can levitate or they can live off of prana or people who claim that they've been abducted by aliens, um, people who have tulpas or people have who have different kinds of uh, supposed supernatural powers and what have you, right? Maybe bring those mm -hmm. to her attention and have like a light conversation about like, well, do you believe this? And then examine why she does or does not what would what would she need to see if she were going to start believing in uh, being able to live off prana which is uh, some kind of energy that sustains your body and spirit without having to eat food and then maybe showing her examples of how no one's ever actually pulled that off they uh always sneak food in hotel rooms with hidden cameras and what have you um maybe attack it uh, collaterally a collaterally a collateral attack on that uh, in a friendly way and being very aware, having great situational awareness, that there may be a point that your friend says, I don't wanna talk about this anymore. Um, or reading the body language, reading the words, make sure there's complete consent in the conversation because you don't wanna lose a friend uh, and you don't want it to become a personal attack. And that can happen. Um, I'll say this, I have conversations with a really good friend of mine who's a Catholic. Um, and the more ACA stuff I do, I don't really share this work with him because I don't want him to feel like I'm attacking him as a person. I think he's a great guy. He's a good friend of mine. Um, and we just, um, he'll text me questions about miracles or, you know, issues about, you know, eternal punishment for finite crimes and stuff like that. And I'm always ready to stop the conversation and switch to video games if I need to. Because mm -hmm. um, I know that... Yeah over the long haul, if we keep on having these conversations and I keep coming back to a reasonable position and, and talking about the ordinary things in life to talk about, uh, you know, you want to buy a car, what kind of evidence would you need to trust that this is a good purchase? Okay. Very good. How about buying a home? Okay. How about, you know, going outside during certain weather phenomenon? What would you need to know to see if it were a safe thing to do? And then now let's talk about, you know, the, the mysteries, discussed in the Bible. Do you see how there's a qualitative difference between the kind of evidence you accept 
to determine whether you want to go out during a hailstorm versus whether or not you believe that something happened thousands of years ago. So yeah. that, yeah. There, there's something here and, and I want to, I'm hoping this makes it clear because we've kind of danced around this a bit. Yeah. And that is the notion that it's not at all extraordinary to run across people who believe in ghosts. It's not at all extraordinary to run across people who believe in a God. It's not extraordinary to think, ah, someone believes they encountered a ghost. What is extraordinary is that someone should be right about the ghost. That the, the, the claim ghosts exist and are real and I have detected one is the extraordinary claim. It's not at all extraordinary that someone could believe something that is separate from whether or not the thing they believe is actually true. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, everything you guys are saying is I just started Peter Bogosian's book. Uh, so everything y'all are saying is exactly, you know, it's good. It's, it's what he's saying too. So it all makes sense. Cool. So yeah, keep, thanks. Um, keep, keep it friendly, Heath. Just, just you're exploring the world together. You're exploring the known and the unknown as best you can. And, you know, the most important thing about this is, is keeping a dialogue open and, and staying friends and maybe help guide someone toward a more skeptical view of the world, which is, I, I personally yeah. think, is more grounded in reality. Yeah. Okay. Sound good, Heath? Cool. All right. Yeah. Thank All you, guys. Right. Thank Great you. Great talking to you. Where are we going next, sir? Well, I think, I, you know, not to be a downer, but I think Adam in Romania is dealing with uh, fear yeah. of death, grief as an atheist, and that kind of ties back into uh, uh, the passing of, uh, of Randy. Yeah, go, go for it. Thank you, Johnny. Hey, Adam, Thank how are you Johnny. doing? Did I talk to you the other week? Um, I'm so did glad. I talk to you as a call screener? Did I talk to you the other week? No, no, this no? is my first time. Oh, fantastic. Great. We got another fantastic caller from Romania. Good to... What What do you want to talk about with us today? Uh, you had another one from Romania? Yes, sir. We've got international yeah, anyway. callers. Come Call call us. We we love to hear from people all over the world. That's, that's absolutely great. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot... I can't uh, control myself. I have to thank you guys for all your efforts and all your work for the benefit of reason that especially you met your arguments uh, regarding slavery in Exodus 21 uh, it in the Bible has me to prove for me personally and bet for many other people that that book is garbage and uh, definitely it's not the revealed uh, truth of God well Adam but thanks that, a lot that, thanks that, a lot for Oh, sorry. I didn't want to cut you off, Adam, but I let's talk. It. We we appreciate you telling us that. We appreciate yeah. you calling. And sure, sure, sure. I don't know what I don't know what time it is I over in Romania. It. Is it? Stop. No, it's all right. Uh, so you want to talk about what how to deal with the fear of death and grief as, a, as an atheist? Is this a personal thing that you're going through right now? If you're willing to share with us? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, <clears throat> uh, I sometimes have these episodes of uh, unrational fear of death. So do I. I. Know, uh, from previous shows that uh, you had something similar. So yes. what I'm talking about is an irrational fear. I'm saying irrational because I, I don't fear death as, uh, you know, uh, an eternal experience of uh, the other side of, you know, nothingness. Be because even when I was an agnostic, I, I dealt with it in a rational uh, way. Okay. In the sense that uh, the only uh, way to experience uh, anything after that is most likely exactly like uh, experiencing, I sound like Borat, don't I? <laughs> Oh I just God. watched that this morning, <laughs> so a, just a slightest bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm not using English every day. <laughs> I just realized I sound like that. Anyways, so Adam, your uh, your your English yeah. is infinitely better than my Romanian or my <laughs> Spanish or my German. <laughs> okay, so my hat's off to you. This is, okay, yes. this is okay. So uh, the idea was that uh, uh, experiencing whatever comes after that is exactly what I experienced before I was born. 
right? So that it's not rational to fear that because it's exactly the opposite of any experience. I think your dog agrees. It, Adam, there's, there's, you, you're there's nothing. Yes, yes. Adam, it sounds like sounds like there's what you're trying to. to do. It sounds like what you're dealing with is is uh. Are, do you like being alive? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's not bad, is it? I mean, it's it's fun to be here. Sometimes no, 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 it sucks, no, no. right? Okay. But what I'm saying is, you want to keep okay. the party going, right? I mean, I do. Sometimes I kind of wish no, I could go to sleep no, no, no. and wake up in the future, but a, a lot of times it's um, it's the it's the fact that I want to continue going on. I don't want to stop, right? Um, for no, no, me, the wait, wait, Johnny, Johnny. Oh, okay. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. What are we talking about? I'm, I'm talking. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. So listen, I sometimes have these episodes of uh, irrational fear, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But uh, I, I made notes. <laughs> so this fear of that, what I'm talking about, it's a very specific, strong, dreadful feeling, very short duration. It always happens before I fall asleep mm -hmm. and my mind wanders in all directions. I don't even think about that or infinity or some bullshit like that. It's just mm -hmm. an abrupt sense that I slip into oblivion. It's, it's, it, it's crushing my, my I, I'm going to use this, uh, Matt's going to hate it, soul. <laughs> so okay. uh, my question is, the, uh, is this just my fucked up brain or have you encountered this? Have you heard about something like this? It's, uh, it helps. Uh, so it wakes me up in an instant and leaves me shaking for a few minutes. Adam, it's a horrible. Yeah. Let me, let me, let me, let me address this again. So maybe I went down the wrong Avenue or maybe I was taking a long way to get there, but I have this experience on occasion. Sometimes it, it hits me on a nightly basis. Sometimes it goes away for a year or two um, where I'm yeah, about to I fall asleep. I get my mind starts wandering and it ultimately comes down to the radical finitude of my existence. And I get scared and exactly. I cold people. Exactly. I, and sometimes I get up, I listen to music, I watch some Star Trek or whatever. I play so some guitar oh my or God. whatever. I'm not alone. Uh, <laughs> you're not alone. No, 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 no. There's millions of people out there. And I'll tell you this. I went to I went to a therapist about this and some other stuff. Just, you know, uh, a counselor like Counselor Troy or other counselors out there. And I decided I wanted to, to talk about that because it was, I wouldn't say it's crippling, but it can, it, exactly. it, it, it ruins your sleep. It's I'll say that. It's an right? And the, my therapist That's told me. Yeah, let me say my my well, it's an inconvenience, but I think it's an I think it's a your brain is functioning well. Uh, my therapist talked about some people deal with death by just accepting it. Those are the fortunate ones. Uh, they just incorporate it into their existence. They don't want to live forever. It's just reality. Tough nuts, baby. Uh, you're gonna die someday. Okay, let me go do something uh, now that's fun and enjoyable and meaningful to me. Now, other people will turn toward comforting untruths. Right. That might be they can extend their lives indefinitely through metahuman things, download their brain into yeah. a computer or they can pray to Vishnu and you'll be preserved somewhere in some way. Um, and other people struggle with it. And um, I know. You know the best you can do, I think, is to try to make the life that you do have as meaningful as you can. Um, some people turn yeah. toward uh, meaning by through art, their art will, uh, they'll live on after them and their art will exist forever. Well, at least until the sun goes Nova. Some people have children and their children and grandchildren and, and the subsequent generations will preserve a part of them genetically and culturally. There'll be a part of them that lives forever. And some people just, uh, they, that's not satisfying to them. And you're gonna have to struggle with that probably until you find something that gives you that answer or uh, it never, it never gives you the answer that you're looking for. That's just another hard knock of the world for some people, probably for me and maybe for you. I don't know. Yeah. I don't ever suffer from that Thank kind you. of existential dread. Granted, I occasionally have like insomnia or sleep issues. I had had that this past week. Um, 
and yeah, I can't, you know, my, like my brain won't turn off and things like that, but I don't have that sort of existential dread, but I have met many people do. And, and Johnny, as he pointed out, does, um, I don't know what's available for you in Romania, but, um, you may still be able to access the psychotherapist project. And even, you know, if they don't have anybody for you to talk to in Romania, they may have other recommendations. Uh, but what I can say is that I don't think what you're, what you're experiencing is particularly unusual. Um, and you know, if, if the thing that's bugging you, you're like, oh, well, you know, uh, it's soul crushing. Yeah, I, I understand, you know, even though we're not talking about an actual soul, I'm fine with the notion of a metaphorical soul or uh, talking about, hey, here's okay, here's who we are and what we are. Uh, I know what people mean roughly metaphorically when they say something is soul crushing, because what, what they're really describing is this is is so heavy in, in causing me anxiety and making it difficult for me to breathe and do things and sleep and move on. Um, you're not alone and you might benefit from some professional counseling, uh, on that subject. I wish we could destigmatize mental health issues to the point mm -hmm. where everybody was, oh yeah, of course I need to go talk to an expert. I mean, you know, when my, when my kidney is not working right, I go talk to an expert. Why wouldn't that be the same thing for when my brain is fucking with me? Yeah. My suspension isn't working quite right. I'm hearing sounds in my car. I go to the mechanic. I'm feeling thoughts that I am having difficulty dealing with. I talk to a, a, a therapist or a counselor or a psychologist. Uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And I think that might be a legacy of religion. I know that in the some of the news things that we cover on the nonprofits is people saying that if you're not going to God with your problems, then you're you're worshiping. I know Shannon Q did a video about that. Uh, I thought it was really fantastic about this, this stigma against secular therapists. That is to say, actual therapists that use scientifically proven methods to help with mental health issues, as opposed to um, some kind of a, uh, a pastor who is going to turn to an ancient book that, that, uh, that has very antiquated views toward uh, women and foreigners and things, uh, people like that. But no, talk to somebody. I, I, I'm not going to advocate for the use of illegal drugs. All right. Uh, just for the record, don't do that if it's illegal where you're at. However, with that said, I have some uh, friends who have experimented with different kinds of uh, substances that has helped them get through some of the uh, anxiety ridden times of their lives. It helps gives them a little bit of clarity and direction that helps them shoot that curl. Um, again, I think it's a little dangerous to do it, but um, they found it to be very helpful. And I know that the, the scientific research behind that is ever increasing. And so hopefully within the next 10 years, we'll have therapeutic uses of hallucinogens or other kinds of drugs that will help people maybe reset the chemicals in their mind, help them see maybe a light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to that black pit of death that we're all headed toward. Um, so please don't watch this show just before you're going to go to bed. Watch it <laughs> yeah. in the bright in the daytime, okay? <laughs> yep. Can I say something? Sure. Yes, sir. So uh, my... My my point point it's uh, it's not it's it's more like an inconvenience, not an existential problem. My my, my life is, is is okay, and I actually managed to treat the sim the symptom and avoid the whole ordeal simply by listening to audio books or something with the sure. patient. And my mind is preoccupied with the visualization of this story, and I get over it. Or and it helps a lot if you have somebody a loved one and you just can cuddle it i'm just saying that the symptom is gone and i can work around it easily the problem yep. I, my question was is is this uh, uh an ins I, am i fucked up or the, uh, this happens and i understand your answer and thank you very much that you're not fucked up you're, you're you are as fucked up as isolated. all of us yep okay it's thank you the other question, uh, may I have another question? Um, yeah, I, I will allow it. Let's make it quick because we got we got some really great callers on here. And uh, what do you got? Okay, I understand. Very quickly. Yes, sir. So how does a funeral for an atheist, how a funeral service for an atheist should look like? How does it look out there? How does yeah. 
There's no, there's uh, no, there's uh, no answer to that. The funeral for an atheist could be whatever that atheist wants. It could be whatever that atheist family wants. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you can cut me up into pieces, parts, give them to whoever, and uh, forget about me. Uh, but if you want to do something, have a little party. Uh, and it, and if you know, by the way, um, if if I'm going to be expected to carry out for example, my parents' wishes with regard to a religious funeral on their behalf, I'm going to do that because that is their wishes. I'm going to respect their wishes. And it's the same thing that I would want to happen for me. And so I don't, th there's no set atheist funeral. There's no right answer to this. Um, what you should do is write down whatever instructions and guidance you want for your funeral and make sure you get that to the people who you think are going to respect it. Other than that, I don't know that there's anything to really add. Yeah, I would say, you know, whatever you think would be meaningful to the people who survive, right? Um, some people want it, want them to want themselves to be remembered in a in a very somber, serious, they were an important person way. Uh, you know, I guess honor the wishes of the deceased with it with a mind of making it uh making the survivors appreciate who this person was. But again, it's it's whatever the deceased wanted. And uh, if, if there is no guidance, I would try to frame how important that person was in your life. Uh, I, I hate to mention Star Trek again, but, but when Tasha Yar dies at the end of season one, they have a little, she leaves a message behind uh, to the different people on the, the bridge of the Enterprise, like Captain Picard, you meant so much. You were like a father. You were like a mentor. Data, we slept together. It was awesome. And you're really sweet. You know, Riker, you're a badass. You know, whatever will convey that person's life so that we can really appreciate because, you know, we can we can wish that these people continue onward after death. We can wish all we want. But the fact is they had an effect upon us and we want to honor that effect so that in life it, it ends, but our effect doesn't end. It, it trickles out into the universe. And so there's no right way to do that. Whatever seems right. Um, yes. Does that make yes. any sense to you, Adam? Tony, uh, yes, uh, if I may, I, uh, I, I don't think I uh, expressed myself correctly. My question was, how, how will uh, Randy's the, the amazing Randy's funeral will look like. Will there be rabbis? What? I don't know. How, what? I, I, I don't. I don't know anything about Randy's funeral. Yeah. Why don't you uh, watch and find out if it's if it's made public? It may be a private affair. But um, again, I think it comes down to what the deceased wishes for. But uh, I really appreciate you calling, Adam. You had some good questions, and you're dealing with some real issues. We're going to let you go now. We're going to move on to somebody else. Uh, feel free to call back if you have any more questions. Okay. All right. Hello. And uh, you take care and say hello to uh, uh, all the other Romanian atheists out there for us. Okay. All right. Matt, who looks good? Oh, we can try Eddie. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think the people out there want to see Matt take Eddie. Well, I'll find out what Eddie has to say. Yeah. Could be right. Yeah. Um, hi, Matt. Okay. Um, I would like to start by commemorating the amazing Randy. Um, I think he was a wonderful inspiration uh, and an amazing magician. So it, it was incredibly sad to hear uh, of his passing. So that's what I wanted to say at first. Okay. Yeah, so then, no, he, he, I, I have his book, and he was one of the. He has lots of books. He was a. Yeah, the, the truth about Uri Geller, that's the one I was interested in. And I sure. um and then there's Flim Flam and a bunch of others, but yeah. Yeah, but that's the one I have. So, you know, he was a really good person and uh, you know, I'm proud to be from the same country as him. Uh the now I, I want to address some of your claims, okay, because I think you've been saying some stuff that I think is simply bad argumentation. And that's when well, you are talking against then, him. then what we should do just to make sure this goes as smoothly as possible, since you seem to think I have several claims that are bad or several arguments that are bad, just present one really clearly and I will do my best to clarify. 
All right. So, so you've been shooting your mouth off about God and morality. That's a okay. good start. You can That's just, a real good you start. can just hang up on him right now. Yeah. Goodbye, Eddie. Thanks for wasting our time. So close, Eddie. Yeah. So I, close. I was, I was as sweet as possible to you. Um, I thought I recognized your voice. I thought it was, really? um, you know, uh, that you were probably a snarky little shit, but I didn't want to just assume that because I'd like to actually have a conversation. So maybe if you call back someday and act like a grown up, when people are treating you like a grown up, then we can have a conversation. Until then, and I'm saying this with a smile on my face and with no anger in my heart, go fuck yourself, you little troll. Yeah, he's a, he acted like a clown. You can do better, maybe. We'll find out. All right, let's try some uh, really good callers here. Um, how about Meerkat? Meerkat, you're on the line with Matt and Johnny. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. So, uh, yeah, um, my question is, if, if an atheist doesn't want to become a Christian... Why should I bother trying to convince them that my God exists or holding, uh, you know, yeah, that's it. Okay. So I have two quick things on that. Uh, number one, uh, first of all, I'm not convinced that you run across someone who doesn't want to become something like I have no interest in becoming a Christian, but I would be happy to know what is true if it's true. However, as a Christian, I'm assuming you accept the Bible, right? Yes, everything. Yeah, every, everything. So when mm -hmm. then the answer to your question is in your Bible. Your job, the reason why you should share Christianity with atheists, whether they want to accept it or not, is because God has commanded you to in your Bible according to your own beliefs. Have you read 1 Peter 3.15? Have you, or do you understand the great commission that you are to go ye therefore unto all the world, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have, I don't, do you even know your Bible? Why would you call an atheist to find out why you should spend time convincing an atheist when that's what your Bible tells you to do? Um, yeah, I'm saying, but an atheist would have to want to have a desire to be a Christian. No, you you don't. So first of all, do no. you know? No, Meerkat, do you know an atheist inner desire? The answer is no. Do you know what evil lurks hang in on, our hearts? Hang on, hang on, what? hang on, hang on. Do you know what's in an atheist's inner heart and what the, whether what they secretly desire? The answer is no. Go ahead and say it. No, I do not. That's why. Cool. Now, hang on. Are you God? Uh. Are you? <laughs> no. Okay. No, Do you know what God knows about me? Do I know? No, I do not know. Do you know? Do you believe that the Holy Spirit is is able to work through you for God's efforts? Hello? Hello? Huh? Oh, do, okay. you, said, do you believe that the Holy Spirit can work through you to achieve whatever God wants to achieve? Well, you, well, you, you broke up there. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit can work through you to achieve what God wants to achieve? Yes. I just, then stop, I then stop second-guessing your God, because God has commanded you, according to your beliefs, to preach the gospel. God has commanded you to share with those people and be prepared at all times to give the explanation for the faith that's within you. Why is it that you don't believe what your God has commanded you, and now you're calling an atheist to ask them why you should do this? I mean, you have the most messed up theology I've messed with this week. And I had a guy in my debate on Friday tell me that he thinks the instruction to slaughter all the Amalekites was hyperbole. He, the truth is, it doesn't seem that you believe what God, what you think God wants you. Because if you believe the Bible was God's word to you, and God has instructed you to do this, then there's no scenario under which it makes sense for you to call an atheist show and ask them, why should you preach to atheists? The answer is, because you believe God commanded you to. So that's not what I said. I'm talking, this is why I ask, you know, if... If somebody, you know, I always ask atheists, 
if I prove to you that my God exists, oh my God, I'm a Christian or something along that. That's why Mayor, I Mayor you, Cat, because I Mayor don't. Cat, Mayor, you, yes, you don't know. And so, if you ask an atheist and they tell you, what does that tell you? And and if they say no, I I just say, well, then what's the point? Okay, then you're not following what you believe God has instructed you to do because God didn't say no, only talk. Hang on, let me finish. Yes. Does, does the Bible instruct you to yes. only preach to the people who want you to preach to them? Well, you, you, I think this is that's this this is why I okay yes. I'll just say yes. Go ahead. Wait, you're saying the Bible tells you to only preach to the atheists who want you to preach to them. What verse is that? Because I don't remember the Great Commission saying, go ye therefore unto the world, preaching unto all nations, except for those who don't want to hear it. I don't remember that passage being in there. Where is that in your Bible? Well, that's preaching the gospel is one thing, but the other thing is, I'm saying, trying to convince them that my first Peter three fifteen. Have you read it? If you first Peter first Peter three fifteen. Have you read it? Yes, I have. What's it say? Does it say, "Be prepared at all times to give a reason for the ex explanation for the faith that's in you to to those who want to hear it"? No, it does not say that. No, now, it does say to do it to anybody who asks, and so I I, I don't understand. I don't even understand what your question is because you're like, why would I share the gospel to people who don't yeah. want to hear it? When the, when the, when the answer is because no, God told you to. I didn't why don't that. you why don't you listen to your God? I did not say that. You just you put that in. And I I said convince that my God Jesus. exists. That's not the same thing as saying uh, tell them what the gospel is. What what, what, what whether my God exists in the first place. First Peter three fifteen doesn't say to share the gospel. First Peter three fifteen says to explain why you believe. Uh, Meerkat, let me let me let me no, jump in no, here. No, stop. Oh, Hang on. Yeah. What? So what is the problem? You're saying before I I I preach the gospel. I'm talking about after I preach the gospel. No, you're not. And they, let's just say, yeah, I am. Because no, just, you're not. Oh, I don't. Okay. You're asking. You asked at the beginning of this call. You asked at the beginning of this call. You asked why should you share? Why should you share your beliefs? Why should you try to convince someone that your God is real if they don't want to know? I didn't say that. And first, and first of all, I'm I saying I'm. Inter keep interrupting me. See how much longer you get to stay on the phone. First of all, I'm saying. I'm not convinced that there are people out there who would not be interested in the truth, but if so, then you don't talk to them. But the reason is, the reason that you you share that, oh, you hung up on me. I'm sorry that you don't believe in the God that you claim you do. I'm sorry that you claim to believe the Bible, but you don't know it and you don't follow it. I'm sorry that you were so weak in your Christianity that you had to call into an atheist show to be educated by an atheist about what you're supposed to know as a Christian. I think his question is just flawed at its heart. Um, from the get-go, and I think he was flummoxed at us not understanding what he was unable to articulate. And uh, so I think there's this idea that that non-believers ch actively choose to not believe, right, as opposed to belief flowering from some sort of process within the mind that allows you to accept certain facts as sufficiently uh, supported by evidence. Um, just the way it was written, I don't know if that was, I, I'm, I'm have up uh, ultimate confidence in our call screeners. I think that he was just really confused and, uh, ha hadn't had a, it wasn't a full baked thought. I think, uh, we spent a lot of time on that and it was a no bake, like a no bake, yeah, cookie. no -bake, no -bake. cookies though, or some those of are, favorites. those are pretty good sometimes. Yeah. Where are we going uh, next? Let's see. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, Ray from Colorado. Uh, Christian nations GDP is higher in Christian nations than it is others most of the time. Ray, you're on with Matt and Johnny. Account for this. What are you talking about? So the U.S. GDP, total GDP is around $22 trillion okay. per year, uh, usually. 
that's higher than a lot of other nations, especially atheists. It's higher than all other nations. Uh, it's higher than all other nations. It's higher than China. Yes. Yeah. Uh, North right. Korea. But but so what? Uh, I mean, even Japan. Well, so so, but also, have you compared the population of of Japan and the landmass of Japan to the United States? I mean, we have a big space here with a lot of people. Uh, but in any case, right. what difference what difference does GDP make? What is that? What is that a measure of? Well, I would say the laws have something to do with it. Yeah, but so the laws, uh, the laws in the United States, it. the United States is a secular nation with a secular constitution. And the only time that it addresses, for example, God belief is in Article 6, where it says there'll be no religious test for any public office or trust. So if the point is, oh, the United States is a Christian nation with Christian laws, that's just not true. Yeah. And the First Amendment. But if my engine works better than your engine, would you say I'm, my, I'm doing something right? And Is this like so a, you're not comparing engines. Right. You, you're wanting to look at how fast the car can go and talk about who's sitting in the back seat looking at what picture book. I'm talking about the actual engine. The engine for the economy is based on the individuals, the laws, all of these things, none of which has anything to do with religion. You're sitting here saying because the person driving the car believes that Jesus wants them to drive, that all of a sudden that's why they can drive faster. And that's a bullshit argument. No, I think this is like a prosperity gospel kind of a view to it. Um, I don't accept that this is a Christian nation. There's tons of Christians in here. Their Christianity informs their voting habits, informs their purchasing habits. But it's not a solely a Christian nation. It is not structured in a Christian, in, in a Christian way, in quotation marks. So, um, I disagree. Really? Well, okay. Okay. So let's have it. Actually, wrong. Let, what about the it. what about the United States laws as Christian? Yeah. If you're a Christian, can you worship other gods? No. If okay. you're if you're in the United States, are you allowed to worship whatever god you want? Is it, so you're going to force me into a yes or no session. I'm asking well, you yes or no questions. I'm sorry that you don't like the fact that the answers yeah. don't seem to fit your model, but that's the problem I'm trying to expose. Some things are just yes and no or yes bullshit non-response. Can I force you into a yes or no session? Would that sure, go for it. I, yeah, go for it. it okay, it, is the U.S. Yeah. majority Christian? Yes or no? Yes. It's also majority yeah. women. Okay, is the U.S. Does the U.S. have the best military, yes or no? The best? I'm not sure. I will say the most powerful military. Do we spend more on it and have better military capability? Yes. Let's hope we don't find out the real answer to that, but let's say yes for purposes of argument. <laughs> right? Are laws related to morality? Yes. No. Are, are laws no. generally related to morality? There's, there's no requirement that something be legal or illegal based solely on whether or not it's moral or not. There are plenty of things that are immoral that aren't illegal, and there are things that are illegal that aren't moral. I'm going to object There's not as, a one-to-one -one tie there. I'm going to object as vague, ambiguous, and not reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence on this one, because that's a crap question. But I would say that if we're talking about morality as a system that produces certain results, then the laws are... Uh, are moral in the sense that we are trying to produce a, a fair and equitable society, but well, we're trying to, we're supposed to say yeah. on, on, on yes or no. And so the answer is, Oh no. yeah. And then, 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 well, <laughs> so what, what's your next yes or no? Keep going. Cause I'd love for you, for you to get me do you, on something yeah. that's clearly false. The United States is not a Christian nation. Yeah. Do you think that the U S would be as prosperous as it is if it was a pagan nation? I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know what what specific uh, what specific principles, I, and I don't know what a pagan nation would be. Do you think yeah. the Do you think the United States is a female nation? No, it's male and female. But but aren't there mm. more aren't there more females in the United States than males? Doesn't that make it a majority female nation? And doesn't that? Yeah. So so now that means it, under your argument, based on there being more Christians here than than others, and the, and you you're suggesting. If there are more Christians, then it's a Christian nation. Then by that same reasoning, it should be a female nation, right? 
I would say it's slightly majority female. I wouldn't call it a female nation. Correct. And I would say it's a slightly majority Christian nation, but not a Christian nation. Because the laws of the the United States are not, not in any way based on Christianity. And the Treaty of Tripoli, by the way, which was unanimously ratified by Congress, expressly announces that the United States is in no way founded upon the Christian religion. And that was unanimously voted, uh, approved once the Tripoli was, uh, treaty with Tripoli was signed. So we have a legal document established by Congress, which identifies to another nation that we are not, in fact, a Christian nation. We then have our Constitution, which only mentions religiosity in the sense that there can be no religious uh, uh, test for any public office or trust. The laws themselves of the United States are not necessarily tied to Christianity in any strong sense. It allows for other gods. It allows for uh, speech against gods. It allows for all these things. Uh, is adultery immoral? Yeah, I would say so. And you think Christianity well, holds adultery as immoral as well? Yeah. Is it is adultery illegal in any in any sense uh, where someone could realistically be prosecuted for it in the United States as a crime and put into as, prison as or pay a fee? If you're talking about divorce, yeah, I'm not talking about no, divorce. Not about- I asked you if adultery was a crime. Uh, a crime, uh, polygamous adultery. I think that's we're talking not, about that's adultery. not adultery. Is it punishable by a fine or a term in jail? Here, here's the thing: is it I'm supposed to, according to the Bible, honor my mother and father. If I dishonor my mother and father, right. is that illegal? No. Yeah. How many of the Ten Commandments? It depends. On- how, many, how many of the Ten Commandments are actually actually have an analog in United States law? How many of them? Okay, I, I would say, well, the "Do Not Murder" or "Thou Shall Not Murder" is one of them. "Thou Shall Not Steal." Uh, th- th- those are the same. There's not. There's not a "Thou shalt not kill" and "Thou shalt not murder." That's one commandment. Do you not know the commandments? What's the first commandment? With that, "Thou shalt not." It, if you look in the Hebrew, it does mean murder. So, "Thou shalt not murder." I, I, but you don't get to. You don't get to pretend it's two. Here, let's go through the Ten Commandments in order. What's the first one? If I remember right, I don't know them offhand, but I believe it's... Uh, Wait, aren't you calling to be the defender that this is a Christian nation? Shouldn't you know what our laws are based on? What kind of a defender of the faith are you? I would say it's honor, honor thy mother, thy father. Is that You're wrong. Number one. You're wrong. The one. first commandment is thou shalt... I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That is... God before me. I cannot believe... So, I, mean, I get it. You, you know murder. But I'm always baffled at somebody who thinks that they're a, a defender of the faith and they don't know that the first commandment from their God is, I am the one and only God and you can't worship anybody else. How can you not know that? But let's go on to the second one. What The second, the second one... So, so, first of all, the first commandment, you'll have no other gods before me. Are you going to keep trying to talk over me? Because I'll just fucking mute you. So the first commandment is that thou shalt have no other gods before me. Clearly, the United States doesn't follow that commandment because I'm allowed to have whatever God I want or, or otherwise. That we agree on. The second commandment is thou shalt not make into thee any, any graven images. Is that a law in the United States? That you shall not make a graven image. I guess you're right. That's not a law. Sure. And, and the third one is thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So can I say fuck God and fuck Yahweh and fuck Jesus and fuck Allah and, and be under no possible repercussions from that? Matt, the fuck police, I think, are knocking on your door right now. Mm. They're going to arrest you, take you to fuck jail. If you, if you said that in a public forum, you might get some sort of indecency. You're, you're fucking wrong. Right. You are monumentally yeah. fucking wrong. I'm on here with a lawyer. Johnny, can I say this out in public? Can yeah, I say it can. on the steps of the Capitol? Can yeah. I shout it through a megaphone on the steps of the Capitol if I have a permit to gather there? Yes, you can. Yeah. So that's three so far, and you've been wrong about all three. Wow. That's, what, what's the what's the fourth command? You're gonna probably, you're probably. Well, I what's was going to say you're probably going to have to answer for everything you just said at some point, whether. Wait, it's one of those. Who? I don't it's know. One of those. Who? Are you fucking threatening me? Is that what yeah. you're doing? Did you decide to threaten me? Is that what? Is that how we're going? Because you're fucking losing and you're being embarrassed publicly. So now you're going to say that I'm going to have to answer for it. Is what's it the first fire? What's the first? What's the fourth commandment there? 
Oh, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm going to, I'm just saying if there is a God and you just said those. Yeah, yes, yeah. I know you're threatening me with yeah, your yeah. fictional best friend. Would you stop threatening me, whether it's your <laughs> fictional best friend or not, and actually answer the questions? Cause I'm getting ready to own you like a slave. Okay. So the fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Is that a matter of law in the United States? Am I required to keep the Sabbath in the United States? I will say that a lot of job places are required to give you. Holy shit. Yeah. You are the most dishonest person on this ever. I'm asking about what the law is. Can I be legally, can I, can I be legally found guilty of anything for not keeping the Sabbath holy? No. How about honoring my father and mother? Am I required to do that? Well, if, I mean, if if by that's that's a contextual issue because if you're killing somebody and you're dishonorably dishon- wow, you are the most dishonest interlocutor I've had a the displeasure of having a conversation with. I asked about honoring your father and mother, and you want to suggest that killing them would be dishonoring them. Are you stupid or are you being honest? Here? Not that directly. Not yeah, that's directly. what you said. I think he's a he's a no bake cookie, Matt. Yeah. I, I, don't I don't think I you wonder... know the first thing about your Bible yeah. because the next commandment is thou shalt not murder, and that's a matter of law. But the one after that is don't commit adultery, and that's not illegal. Mm-hmm. The one after that is don't steal. Congratulations, we now have a second one that is actually mm-hmm. a law. The one after that is do not bear false witness, and that's only illegal if you're sworn to tell the truth uh, uh, in in a courtroom, in which mm-hmm. case you could be held accountable for perjury. After that, it's do not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's animals, et cetera, like that. Mm -hmm. The United States is built on coveting. It is keeping up with the Joneses. That is the foundation of our economy that produces the GDP that you want to brag about. The GDP of the United States is based on a violation of the 10 commandments, which is about keeping up with the Joneses and coveting what your neighbors have. Covering you, your have, you have come ass. in with yeah. the most embarrassingly bad sequence of arguments Wait and a- general ignorance about your own religion, and the laws of the country in which you reside. What else you got for us? That last, that last one, that last one that you mentioned, I, I don't agree with that because people work to buy a house so that they have shelter and so that they have food, not because they want to be better than their neighbors. No, I didn't say better than. I said keep up with it. That's why people try to live in the better neighborhood. That's why people try to find a better job. That's why people go out and buy the the next iPhone, even if their current iPhone is good. You you have an, a monumentally indefensible and stupid position, and you should recognize that and change it. Ray, your ideas are bad, and you should feel bad. No, no, you guys are bad. I, that, that last argument I'm, I'm, does not hold up. Uh, I, I don't I don't think the majority of Americans uh, go to work every day to keep up with the Joneses. I don't. And you're an idiot. That doesn't make any sense. You're, and you're an idiot. Assumption about the majority of the population. It's not an assumption about that. I'm I'm telling you from the GDP, the very thing that you called in about proves you wrong. No, it doesn't. The, okay. The Christian go away. I have no, yeah. more, I have no yeah. more for you. I've presented I'm facts done. and arguments, and you're just like, I don't think it works that way. Well, you don't even know your own book. You don't know the law. You don't know the law of the nation that you're in. You have been wrong at every point. If you're right about one point, congratulations. In the correct order does not mean I don't know the book. You don't know them in any order, you lying little shit. Matt, I think I'm done with this guy. Are you done yeah. with him? Yeah. All right. Ray, <laughs> if I uh, ask you what the Ten Commandments are, and you go to murder... Yeah, and you don't know anything else, and you think the first one might be to honor your father and mother, don't pretend that you knew them all. If you knew them all, you would knew, know that two of them are related to laws in the United States, and the rest of them are not. Yeah, half-baked or no-baked. Let's see. I really want to hear a Catholic traditionalist, personally. This one ought to be interesting. I, uh, I, let's go to 10 after this one, though. Okay, claims that he can get or they can get Matt to prove that God exists by asking a few questions. I hope they define God, because if yeah. all they're going to do is define God as my bottle of Coke Zero, I, I already acknowledge it exists. How are we doing, Catholic traditionalists? Hit us up, T- CT. What you got? Hello. How you doing? Hello. Can everybody All right. Hear yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You got some questions. What do you got? Ask, Matt, is... Um, yeah, uh, with regards to uh, uh, does he uh, agree that conceptualization of logic, logical reasoning takes place in the mind? 
I, I have no reason to think conceptualization can take place anywhere other than the mind. Did you say it can take place anywhere other than the mind? I said I have no reason to think that conceptualization can take place anywhere other than a mind. As far as I know, by definition, conceptualizing requires a mind, yes. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, great, so, but you assume that what you're experiencing is uh, actual, that it's true? No, I don't assume that what I'm experiencing, what, my understanding of my experience is true because I know that my experiences are not always true. I've, there's optical illusions and other things. Um, if all you're asking is, do I assume that generally, as a general rule, my senses are reliable, then no, I don't assume that either. I, have a, I am convinced that my senses are reliable as they can dem demonstrably be. Like my eyesight isn't as good as it, as it used to be. But we can measure that. So, okay. Do you assume that you're speaking to me right now? No, I was not speaking to you at the moment that you said right now. But as I'm speaking to you right now, yes. Yeah, I mean, are we having a conversation? Do you assume we're having? I don't know. A I'm speaking to you. Now? I answered that question. Uh, so you're assuming that, correct? I'm not assuming it. I know that I am speaking to you. Oh, so then you're claiming that you know that what you're experiencing is true. Is that your position? No, I'm not. I, so I'm saying I am aware. I know I am cognizant of the fact that I am uttering forth words directed at you. What's the point? So, um, so you know, you keep going to that word, you know. I went to that word exactly one time and I didn't use it. And I didn't use the word no in a sense of epistemology, but in the sense of awareness, which I explained when I went to this. We, have you got a fucking flow chart in front of you that you're consulting where you're going to try to trap me because you're failing? Yeah. Do you even lift, bro? No, I just so want to I just want to make sure that you're that your that your position is that what you're experiencing or what you claim to be experiencing that you know that it's actual and it's real is that your position oh, okay. no okay so are you assuming that it's actual and real even though no. you don't know for, you know for am, am i assuming that what see see you are so unclear what is it that you think i'm assuming well, I thought you were just going to ask me a series of questions. Yeah, or, yeah. Well, I am asking you, and you say it's Yes, like, but they're so. F you, you haven't you defined you terms, and you're so sloppy that it's not you, even clear what the subject is. Yeah. So, do you, so let, do you, let, let's do this. Do you, uh, Holy shit, you, you're not even fucking listening. Go ahead. Please occupy all of my time with pointlessness. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, if you were, if you were able to go ahead and simply answer my questions, I could get you to admit that God exists. But then ask your fucking questions and stop being silly about it. Uh, when, when, did I, when did I refuse to answer your questions? Ask me your questions. Go. Okay. Do you assume or do you know for certain that you're speaking to me right now through the internet? That is not that is a false dichotomy. I neither assume nor know in a knowledge based sense. I am aware. I am aware. Are you going to let me? What if you ask me a fucking question and I'm in the middle of answering it? Why would you interrupt me? You're not answering it. I'm answering. So the fact that you, hey, let me ask you this, caller. When did you stop beating? When did you stop beating your spouse? When, when did you stop beating your spouse? Why are you afraid of taking Darth Darkin's call? I'm not afraid of Darth Dawkins or anybody. Are you going to ask me a question and get the answer or you're, not? You're afraid of him. You're okay. Him because every time he so, calls. So, so, if you're so good at reading my fucking mind, why would you need to ask me questions? And why couldn't you come up with questions that you could ask me in a way that was useful? I'm not afraid of Darth Dawkins or anybody. What I am afraid is wasting my audience's time. And with you sloppy thinkers asking sloppy questions, that's a waste of their time. So yeah. ask the questions. I will give you the answers. And let's get on to proving that God exists. Okay, why won't you take Darth Darkin's call, Matt? Are you going to ask me questions that lead to the proof of God, or are you going to ask me why I won't take Darth Darkin's call? Because you get to ask one or the other, see, and that's it. See, see, audience members, notice that he doesn't answer any... Catholic, no. hang on. No, don't hang up. Don't hang oh, up. Don't hang right. up, and don't fucking interrupt me.
audience members, notice that as he asked questions, I offered answers and I would continue to do that. But notice that this person seems to be a tool for someone else who has frequently in the past called the show and I had in fact interacted with, but we no longer allow because it's a waste of time. So caller, are you going to ask me the questions that prove that God exists? Or are you here to suck my dick to try to get me to pay attention to your soy boy friend, Darth? You need to you're off mute. If you're going to have a conversation. I'm waiting for you because because you and well, not necessarily you, but your other friends like to pretend like soy boy is some sort of an insult. So are you here to shill for Darth Dawkins? Or are you going to ask me the questions about God? Because one of them is relevant to the show. And the other one shows that you are just as useless as the person you're shilling for. So which is it? Watch your language because you're speaking to a Christian. Hey. Hang on. I don't ever have to watch my fucking language around any fucking body, irrespective of what they believe. How dare you suggest that I have to speak to you in a certain way? Are you afraid to have a conversation with me just because I used harsh words? You need to promise me that you're not going to use vulgar. I don't need to promise you shit. Fuck you. Fuck your God. Fuck your arguments. Fuck everything. Are you going to ask me the questions or are we going to move on? Answering my I think he's afraid to ask the questions. You're you're terrified to ask me the questions because you are not nearly as clever as you think you are. You coward. Bring it on. Oh, I think he, he hung up. Say la vie. I know. Aw. I thought you were going to prove God. I thought proving <laughs> would... God was the important thing. Here's, here's the reason why I yeah. did all that, by the way, yeah. for the people who don't know. I already posted a video about this the other day. There's a group of people who have decided that I'm just a terrible coward who won't answer questions and is terribly afraid of all these internet nobodies with no audience and no credentials while I'm having debates with scholars. And so what they've decided to do is suggest that, oh, well, Matt's just a coward. And so if I can just call in and ask Matt these very specific questions, I can prove God. Well, the point of those questions, as sloppily phrased as they are, was to suggest that I believe something that I do not have a justification for. And if he would have started the call by saying, Matt, are there things that you believe that you don't have a justification for? I would have said, yes. That's it. The big trap that, that Mr. Smarty Pants McSmarterton there was trying to get me in was to trap me into saying, yes, I have beliefs that are not justified. Congratulations. If you guys were smart enough to ask the right question, you could have had your answer instantly. But instead, you had to tap dance around. And when I wasn't following the script that Darth Dawkins gave you, you little puppet, he's got his hand right up your ass, moving your mouth with whatever script you've got. And it didn't go the way you wanted. So now all of a sudden, it's Matt's afraid of Darth. Matt's not afraid of anybody. What Matt's afraid of is wasting the audience's time. So let's not. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at two different colors. Do you want to talk about your own experience as a Baptist, Matt, or do you want to talk about this hidden test in the Bible? Which one is more appealing to you? Both. Oh, let's, do, let's do that hidden test. I want to okay. hear about talking snakes. Yeah, let's hear it. Hey, Joe from Missouri, you're talking to Matt and Johnny. Uh, you're on the air. You want to talk about a hidden test in the first two chapters of the Holy Bible? What you got? Yeah, uh, in the first two chapters, in fact, if you refer to the skeptics annotated Bible, they do point out uh, contradictions in the Bible. And five of their first ten contradictions are regarding two creation accounts that don't, don't agree with each other. And I want to agree with Steve Wells on that point. He did point out five contradictions, but, but they actually get solved when you open the book properly and recognize mm. that the second creation account is a genealogical record and must be kept in order. And from that point, the, so, the top, Joe, uh, yes, yes. I just released a video about this the other day. Why are you calling me when I don't disagree with you? I didn't know if you agreed or didn't agree. Or I didn't know you released a video. I, I've pointed out to atheists repeatedly when they say, oh, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are, are contradictory accounts. I've repeatedly pointed out on this show and in a video, which I just released like a month or so ago, to atheists, that's not true. They're not, con they're not necessarily contradictory accounts. Now, Genesis 1 conflicts with the truth about what we know about the order of events in the universe, but Genesis 2 is unclear. 
as to whether or not it's a secondary account, an addition account, a, a supplementary account, or as you want to put it, a, 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 a mystical sort of genealogy, even though I don't think that's necessarily right either. But at the end of the day, all I care about is, is it true? And I have no reason to think it's true. So do you believe it's an ancient writing? Do I believe what's an ancient writing? That's all you need. The Bible. Well, how how ancient? Are they an ancient? Well, let's say uh, the the chapters in, involved. Maybe one of them is thirty five hundred years old. The other twenty nine hundred. I, I have no reason to think they're quite that old, but I'm happy with a couple thousand years. Sure, sure. Why not? Okay. So um, these, I have something completely different than whatever's on your video. What I'm saying is, they actually, if you follow the rules of what's being talked about, what rules? Free, to make it what rules? Uh, it, when it says that there wasn't any plants yet, and and then it says, "Then the Lord made man." What? That's not a rule. I'm asking. You said if we follow the rules, what rules are we supposed to follow? Okay, rules of logic. Rules of logic. The rules within the story. When it's saying when something occurred, it actually means when it occurred. Now, I'm just saying this is a story. I'm not saying. This is something for someone to believe and take literally, etc. What I'm saying well, is, what good is it? Paradox that is that is solvable, and because the purpose of the book is to actually expose talking snakes who think that they can speak for God and tell people what to do. So you've got an interpretation of the Bible that has some kind of a meaning for you, and you think that that's the correct no. reading, or what? No, what I'm saying is, it, it is a test that is designed to take people who are proud and won't check the facts. Humbly How do you know this? Yeah. How do you know this? Because what you're doing is, is, is exactly what Johnny mentioned here. Johnny said, you have your own understanding that you think is correct. Okay. And your understanding is that the, the, the that Genesis is a test designed to, to, yeah. to metaphorically expose talking snakes. How do you know that that's the correct understanding of Genesis? Okay, uh, let me step back a second, because I don't care to convince anyone who, who doesn't want to see what's in here, right? Yeah, I, hang on, what's hang on, hang on, Something. Joe, hold on. Joe, hold on. Joe, the Joe, Joe, hold on. Sorry. Joe, shut up and listen. <laughs> I asked you how you know that your understanding of Genesis is correct, and your response was to say you're not interested in discussing it with somebody who doesn't want to know. Do you think that we don't want to know? Why would we ask you the question if we don't want to know? Yeah, I want to know. Why? Well, how did you come to this conclusion that this is the, re the correct reading? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a question I think is a good place to start. I asked it two minutes ago before you went off on a fucking diversion. Joe, just, just answer the question. Forget about all that. Words, Let, let's focus here. Okay, there are words in chapter 2, 4 through 7, that describe a period of time where in the story something is happening. And what it describes is that there is land and that there are no plants. And when I read that, I said, well, that can't be right because that puts you on day three and it shows that a man is being made. Now, the classical understanding of the story was that man is not made until day six. So that, that seemed to be a dilemma, a paradox that I looked to resolve. And as a, as a point of resolution, I found that I had put together uh, a single account that was the solution to a puzzle. That but worked the question is, Joe, the question is, how does anyone know that your solution is right or that there even is a puzzle? You think you've solved a mystery without demonstrating that there's a mystery and without demonstrating that your solution is correct. Don't tell us more about how you're reading through it and try to reconcile this. Tell us how we can know you are correct. Okay, if you go to the last book of the Bible, which was written about a thousand years later at least, uh, let's say maybe we can't agree on that or I don't know, but that's what, is it, what I've read. It says that there are, it's written a thousand years later, 100 AD versus... It, well, it doesn't make any fucking difference when it was written. I don't care if it was written Thursday. Okay, well, they, they, they refer to a book that no one was worthy to open, including all of the apostles, all those people that had written... Uh, the scriptures and one that was writing the last book. He refers to a book that no one was worthy to open that had seven seals. From then on, you have a puzzle that has to be solved. 
I'm only hoping to start the conversation today, not convince you, because I think there's way. Okay, to- I'm hoping to end a conversation because yeah. we keep asking how we can know that your your understanding is correct, and you're giving us nothing. But I found something else in the Bible. How do we know that your understanding is correct? There's a man on day three in in my solution to the puzzle, that man on day three would be a type or an earliest prophecy of the Messiah who rose on day three. That would be important in the history of Christianity. That's what first took note to myself, and I looked to prove myself wrong for the next three days and beyond that. And uh, what I found was that uh, not only had no one uh, presented this as important before, no pastors, no teachers, no PhDs, wanted to even acknowledge that it was important. Yes. And so in the entire history of humanity, you have discovered something that nobody else, including all the people who share your beliefs and the reverence for that book, have not discovered. And I'm still asking you, how do we know if it's right? No, no, hold on. No, no, I fucking hold on. I'm tired of asking the same question over and over and getting nothing from you. How do we know that you're right? Sure, you're going to know it's right, but I, what I want. And I'm not interested in having a discussion because there are thousands of batshit crazy conspiracy theories and people finding hidden secret messages in their holy books. It happens with the Bible. It happens with the Quran. It happens with the Torah, the Talmud, everything. People do this all the time. If you don't have a mechanism to show that your understanding is correct, you are engaged in something that is a monumental waste of fucking time. When you get a mechanism to show that you are likely to be correct, call us back. Until then, you're just another person with, like, that's just your opinion, bro. Mm -hmm. Expose the talking snakes. Yes, the fact that that you think talking snakes means people who are lying about God is neat. Congratulations on a different view. However, you can't prove that you're right, so I don't care. It's wonderful that that's the message of the book. It's not the fucking, you think it's the message of the book. You can't prove that it's the message of the book. Joe, this is like literary interpretation, you know, like Silas Marner, the golden hair of the child symbolizes the, the, the wealth that Silas Marner wasted. You know, that's nice that you found a symbol that means something to you, right? You know, I watch movies and I read books and I find that there's symbolism that relates back in some way to things that I've experienced in my life and, and, and art is self-referential. I mean, how is it, even if it, even if that was the interpretation you're supposed to take away from those parts of the Bible, is it true or is it just a feature of the story of the fiction? I think you should assume it's fiction. I don't assume it's fiction. Yeah. I, I What I want to get to, Joe, what I want to know is why should I care about this one? Now, I've done this before, but there are older books than the Bible. Question. All right? Like the Rig Veda, yes. for example. Why wouldn't I pour over the Rig Veda? Why wouldn't I parse out each word with a fine-tooth comb and spend the rest of the short life available to me reading that? Before I get to doing that with the Bible, why should I even open the book to begin with to take a page out of Eric Murphy's playbook? Why would I, why would I do that? Tell me why I should do that. Rather than this story is interesting, it's internally consistent, you know, and when the, the when Picard and Q are having a debate at the all good things in the last episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, that it relates back to that first test in Encounter at Farpoint, and therefore it's internally consistent why should I care? Can you tell me why I should care? Maker of the, if, if the maker of the book had a plan to destroy those who would eventually develop into Christianity and try to run the world, control women's bodies because of the uh, because they're proud men that don't check the facts, and if that's the message from the beginning, and you can take the foundation of their book and and their their claims of authority all come from the Bible, and you can say you missed the point of the Bible right in the beginning. You didn't even see that there was a man on day three. Joe, you can you don't need to use the Bible to disprove the Bible. Okay, you can, sure, but you don't need to to look at itself to find that it's it's a defunct book that's morally bankrupt. You can just have a sliver of compassion for the women and the non-Christians in the world that are that that 
get the short end of the stick according to the book that's there. Why bother using itself? I remember years ago having friends that were saying, well, the Bible isn't actually against homosexuality. If you look at this word in this part of the Bible, it actually says man who isn't manly. And that means it's mostly a person who doesn't take on the responsibilities of manhood. It doesn't actually mean a homosexual per Sure. If you want to do that, fine. To find that it's, it's you know, reprehensible. But why bother? I don't. The, the first two pages, if written as a puzzle, are designed to destroy all the assumptions that happen afterward. It's a big if, Joe. If they're it's a big if. Puzzle, they are written to, dis to destroy the claims that come afterward. It's a big if, Joe. I, I, I know that people like to believe that they found secret knowledge. That's appealing. That's it's it's also I, I tend to go down rabbit holes myself, really big into the sovereign citizens. I love learning more about it. They think that they've discovered this secret cabal that runs everything and that there are secret laws. And if you interpret the words of this statute and this constitutional provision, this secret amendment that you can reinterpret all the laws to mean you don't have to pay taxes, you don't have to have a driver's license, you don't have to pay your child support, and you don't have to appear before a court and get yourself put in jail. But just because it could be internally consistent in some bizarro world version doesn't mean that it actually is what it claims to be. You don't, I don't, I don't, I just think you're, you're spinning your wheels on this when you sound like a smart guy who likes to, to dig into things. And why don't you just focus on something else? Why is this the thing you're going to, the hill you're going to die on? You, you say, you say why, but that will get into experiences that have lasted my whole life long. Right. That, All right. Well, that, call somebody who cares because I, I don't. I don't feel the need for you to listen or anyone to care. I don't feel the need. Right. Why did you call in? Then Congratulations. Why did you call? I'm going to do something I wouldn't normally do after I told Johnny he could you, hang up on whoever he wants. I'm fucking hanging up on you because you're wasted enough of our time. All right. There is one caller left, though, that I do want to get to because it's All specific right. questions, and maybe this will be a good caller with a theist. I All hope right. so. Let's get him on here. David, you are on the Atheist Experience with Matt and Johnny. Forget it. You guys have destroyed me. I, I, I don't know what to say after all of that. I'm sorry. Are you a ghost from the past? <laughs> I can hear you. I, I appreciate you waiting all this time, David. I was trying to get to your call. so Thank you. Okay. I, I was going to tell you all about my, my past history and stuff like that, but my God, you destroyed me um, with your other conversations. I was going to ask you, um, when you, uh, Matt and Johnny, uh, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the show. Thank yeah, you for thank your you. patience. I appreciate it. And I, I thanks appreciate for you waiting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, waiting is no problem. Uh, but, but you had specific uh, questions, and I, I wanted to make sure I answered it. Yeah, so. Exactly. Okay. Why do you think that uh, you were not feeling the call to uh, Jesus Christ from the Father? Or did you? Oh, I thought I did. Right. So I, I was convinced that God wanted me to be a preacher, as were my parents, as were the people in the church. And this is this is so... Uh, clearly and obviously true that when I did a debate with Mike Lacona on the resurrection here in Texas, former deacons and members of the church that I went to when I was in high school flew down from Missouri to attend to that in order to ask me during the Q&A, essentially, what happened? We thought you were going on to great things for the Lord. So uh, there was a period of time where I absolutely believed that God wanted me to be a minister. And as, as a matter of fact, for the longest time, it was a calling that I felt that I thought I was running away from. But it says here, you wanted to know, did I believe that Jesus actually walked on water and ascended into heaven? Yeah, I literally believed those things when I was a believer, and now I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you see, that, that's the thing. It's like now I'm, I'm trying to uh, reconcile that with me, but uh, the faith of Jesus Christ uh, supersedes uh, the physical reality of whether he did that or not, and it doesn't really matter whether he he did or not, it was... Whoa, 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 whoa. If he didn't do it, then you believe a lie. Well, I don't believe that the Bible is infallible. Okay. I, so do you believe that Jesus walked on water? I believe he could have. Well, but the point, the that's that is so bizarre. So uh, the Bible says he did. 
you believe he could have, but you won't say you believe he did. What's the point of including a story of something Jesus could have done but didn't do? I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, and also, how do you determine which things are true in the Bible and which ones aren't? Like, what's the, what's how do you what's your tools? What tools do you use? Exactly. So that you you hmm. find that argument, and oh. um, that's what I've heard you say. So yeah, but there is no way I can shake this uh, feeling of being called. Uh, okay. I, you know, I, what's it feel like? I experience. Yeah. What's it feel like, and what what do you think you've been called to? Well, since I was five years old, uh, I went to the uh, Anglican Church, and they told me about the uh, story of uh, the flood. And I went out and uh, that Sunday afternoon, went to the park and was in the water, and I saw the rainbow in the sky. And I thought, oh, sure, this this justifies it, right? And then you I- saw a rainbow, and it justifies what? <laughs> and that would justify the story of the of Noah's flood. So you think Noah's flood actually happened? Because I saw a rainbow in the sky when I was five. So when you were five, you saw a rainbow in the sky, and that convinced you that at one point the entire earth was covered with water? Right, and then I heard that there were seashells on the top of Mount Everest. Yeah, and does is that more is, is the facts around the seashell more consistent with the global flood or with tectonic plates shifting and some portions that used to be underwater are now above water? Which of those is the better explanation for that observation? Better explanation is tectonic. Yeah. And so do you think that, do do you still believe that the entirety of the earth was covered by water? No. Okay. So once upon a time you believe something and now you don't. Right. And you are just like me. It's just that you still seem to believe some things that I don't. And I don't know how to get it out of my head. Uh, it's real. So, so tell me one thing that you still believe. Okay. Faith. Well, faith isn't something you believe. Faith is the excuse people give when they don't have a good reason. If you have a good reason for something and I say, why do you believe it? Then you give me the good reason. And if you don't have a good reason and I say, why do you believe it? You say, oh, it's faith. So okay. faith isn't something you believe. Yeah. F- faith is like saying, I believe it because I have belief. Right. <clears throat> I had, I had cancer of the duodenum hmm. okay. uh, it was, uh, when I was 27, and that was like uh, 32 years ago. I'm 62 mm-hmm. now. Okay. And uh, the doctor sat beside me, and I said, look, doctor, I am getting really, really bad pains here. And he said, look, David, I can't tell you anything. Uh, the fact that you're sitting in front of me, that's a, that's a miracle to me. And this guy does like eight, you know, appendicitis appendices a day and you know david david surely the fact that somebody tells you wow this seems like a miracle to me doesn't mean that you're convinced it's a miracle right chief pancreatic uh doctor of north america what difference does it make is he an expert on miracles (laughs) he's an expert on whether somebody's going to live through an operation no sir no sir he only knows what the statistics in the data show And any doctor that understands this understands that some people go into remission and that some people respond to treatments and that some people do not respond to treatments. And that no matter how bad your prognosis is, medicine is not an exact science where he can say, yep, the only way that you're going to survive is if God heals you. That that is something no doctor, no scientist could or should ever say and still consider themselves a scientific mind. Yeah, and David, so you had cancer, and I'm assuming right. that you don't now. No, I don't. What treatments did you take for your cancer? A couple. A uh, couple treatments, a couple scientific treatments? Two surgeries. Two surgeries, two, two surgeries and, and medication, I'm assuming? No, I didn't have to go through through chemo. or. I didn't ask about chemo, did I? I said, I'm assuming you took medication. And you had two surgeries. Medication. But isn't chemo medication? Yes, but not all medication is chemo. If I asked you, did you drive a car? And you said, I didn't drive a Volvo. Would you be answering my question? Sorry about that. Yeah. So Uh, you had cancer and you had surgery for it. And and I'm assuming now you're cancer free and have been for a while. Have been, yes. 
Yeah. Fantastic. So if you went and had surgery, why are you crediting God? Did God perform this surgery? <laughs> because just prior to the surgery, I had uh, a revelation where God said to me, so David, you're dead now. Or so I thought it was God. Okay. Might not have been God. He said, how are you going to save your brother, your father, and, and anybody else? And I said, I guess, uh, Father, that there's no way I can save them. He says, how do you know it was God talking to you? Because this sounds like an existential crisis. Yep. A perfectly human existential crisis. It's normal. I can imagine anybody doing it. But the fact of the matter is, if your cancer went away after an operation, <laughs> and you think it's more likely to credit God than the actual fucking doctors and the operation, yeah. You are now no longer in accordance with reason and good evidence. If I might interject here as well, um, David, how many people uh, pray for healing and die? I imagine 99.9% .9 of the people on earth who pray and uh, had cancer uh, probably died. So is that God working in mysterious ways then? I wonder how many of those who died thought they got a message from God yeah. near the end of their life. I, I don't, David, I don't think you're, you're an arrogant person. You nope. don't sound like it. It's not that this was very meaningful for you in the time that it happened to you. You had this experience. It profoundly affected you. You got better after receiving medical treatment and you ascribe to your uh, newer healthy status it was God and not the doctors who performed the surgeries on you. And I think you're, you're counting the strikes and ignoring the misses, right? Um, if that's, that's probably not the right way to the hits and the misses millions of people pray for their children to be cured of childhood leukemia or recover from an accident or deformity. Um, people who have missing limbs, pray all the time for him to grow back and they never grow back. Um, what makes them any different from you? Right. Is that it happened huh? to me? I, the only thing is it happened to me and uh, that's the only thing that was different, I guess. It happened to you with medical treatment, right? right exactly. So would you be willing, let me ask you this. Would you be willing to, um, cut off your arm and then <laughs> pray for God to grow it back for you? Or would that be, a, would that be too arrogant of you to do that? It'd be asking for God to perform. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you'd do it. Right. Yeah, do, do, no, you, do you, do you, do you, um, do you put your seatbelt on when you get in the car? Uh, it's the law here in Canada. But do you right. do it because it's safe or do you do it because it's the law? I was pretty arrogant, and I would only do it because it was the law. All right, all right. Well, you know, you should do it anyway because you know it's we don't want to lose you. So, so basically, David, and I, I, I would like for you. I'm going to try to steel man your position, and you let me know where I where I go wrong. Okay. De decades ago, you developed cancer of the bowel. Yep. A and in the course of this, at some point, a doctor seemed surprised that you were alive or recovering or whatever. And there were two surgeries that were done. And since then you've been cancer free. Right. Okay. And, and around the time, I guess, before the surgery, you're convinced that you got a, a message from God that said, Hey, if you die, you're not going to be able to witness for me. Yes. Okay. And you said it, maybe it wasn't God. I don't know how we can know it's God, but if God's message is, Hey, don't die. What exactly can you do about that? Other than going to have the surgeries? Do you think God was encouraging you to have the surgeries so that science could help you? Or do you think that, I mean, cause if like, if I'm God and I know I'm going to heal you, I don't need to send you a message that says, how are you going to serve me? If you're dead, hang on, I'll save you. I just save you. Hmm. Right. Well, to me, it's your personal. So the thing that makes me worry about whether or not I'm going to be able to be God's representative if I'm dead is me being terrified of being dead. If, if, the, if everything happens according to God's plan, I'm either going to be dead or I'm not. 
and God's either going to save me or he's not. And any, any worry about this clearly comes from me. But even if you're like, what does it feel like? Well, okay, so God told you, said, how are you going to essentially serve me if you're dead? Did you hear that audibly? Was it an impression? How do you know that that's what you were told, let alone that it was God? It was it was pretty word by word. Now it could have been drug induced, <laughs> but it was it was pretty word by word. And I was sitting there, and I wasn't as scared. I wasn't afraid of dying. I was afraid my wife has to. Did you hear it? Not did you hear it outside your head or inside your head? Inside. Okay. Let me ask you this: Do you think God wanted you to call and share your story here today? You know what? Yeah. Did you did you get any message from God suggesting you should do that? No. Okay. So here's what I'm going to suggest since we're way over time and we need to wrap up the show. You should go pray and ask for God what message he wants you to deliver to us. And when you get the message that you are convinced God wants you to deliver to, deliver to us, call us back. We'll put you on to deliver that message. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Johnny. You David, can I, can I say something just at the very end here? David, it sounds like you're a caring person and you want to share something that's important to you. You want to help people. Is that part of the message that you want to share? Is that the reason why you want to share it? Actually, I wanted to say that 99.99% .99 of the time somebody thinks that Jesus is talking to them, they're not. Well, D David, I, I appreciate that, but, that. but th this is the sp answer the question, if you would. I'm giving you a softball here. Do you want to help other people? Do you want to make uh, them better off through your actions? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, we know for certain that volunteering your time, money if you have it, your kindness, your compassion, your patience will help people out. So... Rather than going through a circuitous argument for why God and all that is real, you know, show a heck of a lot more kindness to the people around you. Sounds like you probably do, but that has demonstrable results. And just keep that up. If you're called to some greater action, let that be the greater action. Donate to charities that you believe in. Donate your time and energy. Teach kids to read, whatever it might be, remotely, until quarantine's over let 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 your desire to serve god come out through helping people in tangible ways uh, rather than making not the best arguments on an atheist tv show but well, it's it's not even we, we've we sorted all this out call us back when you get a message yeah. from god david and if there's some other way we can help but otherwise you know you live and enjoy your life and try to be decent that's yeah. all, all any of us can really do but we, we, we've got a roll I appreciate your time, David. Thanks. Take Have care, David. Bye. On that note, thus endeth the show. Hey, you put a hat on. I didn't even notice that. Oh, this old thing? Yeah. yeah just happened to be sitting there? Yeah, I just happened to be sitting around. I really wanted at one point to run downstairs and get a whole bunch of tinfoil and like manufacture a tinfoil hat here uh, throughout that. I like uh, that. There are people in chat who are desperate to know the how and why behind that. And mm -hmm. um, all I can say is, I don't know because I didn't know it was going to happen. I wasn't, it wasn't planned, but it's an interesting lesson. And it reminds me of those times when we would test for people's uh, observation of something strange going on in the background of a video or whatever else. Only in this case, it was just my friend <laughs> having fun, being awesome. And I'm really glad that you are here this week. Uh, I hope we can get you back on at other times. Keep kicking ass with nonprofits, which by the way, will remind people you can go and check out nonprofits, youtube.com slash the nonprofits ACA. And you can see the episodes that they are working on right now. We appreciate everybody tuning in. Please stay safe out there and vote. I'm not going to talk about how you should vote or anything else. Just fucking vote. Mm -hmm. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Take care.